So thank you all for joining us for the monthly series for SunCloud Health's Child and Adolescent Professional Development Series. Today's topic is on supporting transgender and gender non-conforming youth. My name is Christy Orr. I'm a member of the outreach team here at SunCloud. My focus is on adolescent outreach. For those who are not familiar with us, we provide integrated person-centered treatment with residential PHP IOP programs in the Chicago area for adolescents and adults with a special emphasis on helping those who are struggling with complex co-occurring issues. If you are interested in learning more or collaborating with our team, my contact information will be listed at the end of our event today and I'll be happy to help. You will also receive an email with follow-up instructions on how to receive your CE certificate. Once our presentation starts, feel free to put your questions in the chat and we'll save about 10 to 15 minutes at the end for Q&A. Our goal is to support you all as community partners with monthly educational events to support your practice. Today's speaker is Dr. John Coleman, our adolescent psychiatrist at our Lincoln Park location. He has lived in Chicago now for 12 years. He received his Bachelor of Science in Chemistry after studying at, studying at Washington and Lee University. After earning his Doctor of Medicine at University of Louisville School of Medicine, Dr. Coleman completed the Adult Psychiatry Residency Program as well as the Child and Adolescent Psychiatry Fellowship Program at University of Illinois in Chicago. He is also board certified in child and adolescent as well as adult psychiatry. Originally from Bowling Green, Kentucky, Dr. Coleman's interest in mental health grew as he did. He always enjoyed working with kids, so he specialized in child and adolescent psychiatry. He is passionate about his work with helping kids and families reach their full potential through proper mental health treatment. Providing help and relief to a population that is often overlooked and misunderstood brings him great joy. When Dr. Coleman is not working, you can find him spending time with his wife and two children, collecting toys and reading comics. And with that, I'll let Dr. Coleman take it away. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for that introduction, Christy. Um, and thank you everyone for being here today um, to help support our transgender and gender nonconforming peers. Um, so very much appreciate um, you all being here today. Um, I will say to begin with that um, the only disclosure that I need to make is that I am a cisgender, heterosexual, Caucasian male, and as such, um, I recognize that the internal experience that I have had over my life does not really reflect the experience of the population that I am speaking on today. So I promise to do my best to try and provide education on a topic um, that I am passionate about um, and have tried to become knowledgeable on over the years. And I hope to share some of that knowledge with you all today. So to start off, the goals of our um, presentation today are to understand the common mental health issues um, for gender nonconforming youth, to understand the role of social and hormonal transitioning, to understand how families and community can support gender nonconforming youth, and to recommend treatments supporting gender identity. So before we start talking, we want to make sure that everybody has some familiarity with the terminology that we may use during this talk today. And so the idea of gender identity is one's internal sense of self as a man, a woman, both or neither. And this is a topic that really, as someone growing up in Southern Kentucky, um, as a cisgendered individual, it never really popped up on the radar until I was actually in medical school and heard these terms for the first time. Even then, I did not really know anyone who was gender nonconforming, um, though later on found out that I had a friend from college who was trans or is transgender. but it's something that we never gave much thought into. However, I said that this is a topic that I've become passionate about. And because I had started working as a child and adolescent psychiatrist, I started to encounter more 
kids and adolescents that had been struggling with not just understanding gender identity, but communicating that and getting support from those around them. And so that's the idea behind this talk is to be able to help people support those that are gender nonconforming or transgender. So cisgender, the term that I have used already, is um, describes a person whose gender identity aligns with the sex that is assigned at birth. Transgender describes a person whose gender identity or expression is different from their sex assigned at birth and the societal and cultural expectations around sex. Non-binary describes a person who does not identify with man or woman gender binary. Gender diverse or expansive is an umbrella term for a person with gender identity or expression that is broader than just the male or the female binary. Um, gender minority can also be used in this term. Agender is someone who doesn't identify with any gender or has no gender. Gender fluid is a person whose gender identity is not fixed and changes over time. And gender fluid people can identify with different genders at different times or a combination of genders at once. Gender nonconforming is also more of an umbrella term that describes anyone whose gender expression or identity does not align with traditional societal expectations. Gender queer is an umbrella term for a person who doesn't identify with a single gender identity. This term also can overlap with non-binary and can be also um, used to describe anyone who is not cisgender. Bigender is a person who identifies with both female and male genders. A bigender person may express two genders simultaneously or fluctuate between, between two genders. Omnigender, a person who identifies as a mixture of several genders or as all genders simultaneously, um, including ones outside the traditional male-female binary. Um, pangender is another term. Intergender, um, a person whose expression and identity falls between genders or combines genders. Demigender um, is an umbrella term for non-binary gender identities that have a partial connection to a certain gender. Um, demigirl, demiboy are terms that are used here. Um, there are other terms that, that I have not included here. Um, and another thing that people also talk about is questioning gender. Um, not sure about their gender at the time. And so the point of going through all of this is to really show how expansive gender is. Um, gender identity is, you know, it, it doesn't, again, fall into that traditional male-female binary that many of us um, learned as we were growing up. Um, and, and it's these internal experiences are very different for for others. And, and the terms are, are there to help others better understand the experience that a person is, is going through internally. So talking in terms then of common mental health issues that are presenting in transgender and gender nonconforming youth. And so what we do know is that there are, we see in, in kids and adolescents that we're treating that have, um, that are, or that are transgender or gender nonconforming, we see that they also are dealing with mental health issues. And, you know, over the, over the more recent years, there, there's been a bigger focus on research and trying to understand, you know, are, you know, transgender or gender nonconforming youth, are they more susceptible or more at risk for certain mental health conditions? Gender dysphoria um, is one term that commonly comes up. Um, and what I need to make um, clear, though, is that being transgender or being gender nonconforming does not um, make or does not mean that a person has gender dysphoria. Um, so it, this is the DSM diagnosis um, of gender dysphoria. Uh, I'm not going to go through and read each piece um, that information is available, 
But again, one of the main core features is that there is a marked incongruence between one's experienced or expressed gender um, and, and primary or secondary sex characteristics. And again, in young adolescents before puberty hits, it's the anticipation of those secondary sex characteristics. Um, there are some some specifiers here too, because we need to to also understand: Are there co-occurring disorders of sex development? Um, and, and then we're also um, describing whether or not gender dysphoria is present post-transitional, um, and giving um, kind of additional mo or qualifiers in terms to the level of gender dysphoria there. So, as I said. We're looking to see our tra um, transgender, gender nonconforming youth more at risk than their cisgender peers. Um, and as it turns out, a lot of the research suggests that yes, um, these um, this patient population is more at risk than cisgender peers for developing things like depression, anxiety, suicidal thinking, suicide attempts, disordered eating, eating disorders, body dysmorphia, and gender dysphoria. So in terms of some numbers, um, a, a study by Toma um, and Associates in 2019, looking at 2,020 different adolescents, uh, 1,148 of those were transgender or gender nonconforming. They found that there was significant statistical difference between the prevalence of suicidal ideation, suicide attempts, and non-suicidal self-injurious behavior. Um, transgender individuals were um, had a prevalence of 84.8 for suicidal ideation compared to cisgender peers at 60.4, suicide attempts 50.3 versus cisgender 31.4, and then that non-suicidal um, self-injury 86.9 compared to 59.1. So substance use is something that a lot of adolescents and adults are dealing with. Um, and so looking in terms of our transgender and gender nonconforming peers, um, there are several studies out there um, that have demonstrated um, that these youth are more susceptible to substance use or use disorders. Um, some recent meta-analysis concludes that the rates of alcohol use and substance use disorders, though, are not significantly higher as compared to cisgender peers. However, transgender and gender nonconforming youth do appear to be more at risk for tobacco use and other substance use disorders. There are several different studies out there that are looking at substance use um, in this patient population. And a lot of the results right now that we're finding are mixed. However, we do recognize that um, there are um, risks for increased substance use disorders and other substance or other substance use um, that can then further develop into substance use disorders. So it's important to consider all of this. Um, so again, that um, our transgender, gender non-conforming youth are, are not stereotyped. Um, and so it's still recommended though to screen uh, for substance use and use disorders, especially when other risk factors for substance use are present. So some different things that we are finding out about eating disorder presentation, um, and I apologize, I've apparently um, put TNG as opposed to TGN for, for some of these. Um, but we found that there are, are different presentations for our transgender, gender nonconforming youth in terms of eating disorder patterns. 
So what we find in some research is that there are higher rates of eating disorders in females, as, or, or, or this is just in traditional cisgender population, that there are higher rates of eating disorders in females as compared to male. Um, oh, sorry, I have missed a slide. Okay. Um, transgender and gender nonconforming youth do appear to be more at risk for developing eating disorders or to exhibit disordered eating. Um, what we have found in research, though, is that transgender males do seem to be more likely to have been diagnosed with eating disorders or engaging in eating disorders as compared to cisgender males. Um, however, it's unclear if there's a statistical difference in transgender females um, as compared to cisgender females in terms of the pre um, prevalence of eating disorders. Um, though many studies do report higher risk for transgender and gender non-conforming youth. And as I was mentioning earlier, before I realized I had missed a slide, um, in cisgender populations, the rates of eating disorders is known to be higher in females as compared to males, which could explain the disparity in the data that we are seeing since there are simply more, there's a higher prevalence of eating disorders in, in females. So those cis, um, transgender females um, are displaying similar rates in terms of eating disorder. Um, cisgender females with gender identity conflict do engage in more eating disorder behaviors though than those without such conflict. And gender non-conforming persons assigned female at birth have a higher risk of eating disorder relative to transgender women. So a few studies um, that I found while doing this presentation, um, the lifetime prevalence of eating disorders among U.S. adolescents um, aged 13 to 18 um, is 2.7%. Um, um, eating disorders, again, were more um, than twice as prevalent among females, 3.8%, as in males, 1.5%. Um, and this is in just adolescent population in general. Um, um, one study um, in 2018 with a sample size of 1,333 transgender youth um, and gender nonconforming youth or gender diverse youth found that approximately 4.3% of transmasculine and 4.2% of transfeminine youth reported a lifetime eating disorder. Um, so almost double what we were seeing in terms of the uh, base rate. One study from 2019 from Duffy um, and Associates found that approximately 18% of trans individuals reported an eating disorder diagnosis in the past year, compared to 1.8% of transgender female youth and 0.2% of cisgender male youth. Body dissatisfaction. Um, is a core feature in several of the issues that we see in psychiatry, eating disorders, uh, for many eating disorders, for body dysmorphia, um, and gender dysphoria. Um, but transgender and gender nonconforming youth experience body dissatisfaction uniquely com compared to their cisgender peers. Um, and body dissatisfaction, as I said, is a core feature just for many transgender and gender nonconforming youth, even those that don't meet full criteria for gender dysphoria. Body dissatisfaction is also a significant risk for the development of disordered eating as well as eating disorders, which when we are looking at it shows that there is that risk um, for um, increased rates of eating disorders. Some other things that we see in terms of just increased risk for transgender and gender nonconforming youth as well as adults are things like harassment, bullying, physical abuse, societal discrimination, 
economic hardship, social isolation, incarceration, HIV and other STDs, homelessness, and sex work violence. All of this, again, is to show that this is a population that is extremely at risk and a population that needs the support of the community. So how do we support transgender and gender nonconforming youth? So Jason Rafferty, um, lead author of a policy statement from the American Academy of Pediatrics, I thought it thought put it very well. Um, so I'm quoting him here. The goal is not treatment, but to listen to the child and build understanding, to create an environment of safety in which emotions, questions, and concerns can be explored. And this is the basis of gender affirming care. But the main point here is the first thing that anyone can do, parent, teacher, therapist, doctor, is listen. Listening starts in the home. But when families are not listening or patient feels uncomfortable opening up to them, it may be someone else to whom a transgender, gender nonconforming youth looks for support. Healthcare professionals, counselors, teachers, other safe adults can provide these safe spaces for transgender and gender nonconforming youth to explore or discuss their gender identity. And the aim is to help the youth gain confidence and skills to be able to have discussions with their family and to help provide education to families. It's important to note, though, that when one of these youth is coming to you for support, especially if families are not aware, the goal is not to out them to their families, but again, to discuss their concerns, their fears, and to see if you can help them get to a place where they feel comfortable having that conversation and to be there for that support and to help provide that education. So you've listened, now what are we gonna do? And families often have many questions on how to best support a transgender or gender nonconforming youth. Also many healthcare providers just feel uncertain about how to answer their questions, because many have limited experience with this population. And so one of the first things that I always recommend to any family asking about resources or supports is to put them in touch with NAMI, the National Alliance of Mental Illness. Um, their website has fantastic links and resources um, to allow um, you know, to, to find resources in local areas, but it's an amazing national um, service and, and organization. Some other national um, sources, um, the LGBT National Help Center, the Trevor Project, um, which is um, a really, really great organization in my opinion, um, working to help suicide prevention um, for our LGBTQ AI plus um, youth. Um, it's a support network um, providing crisis intervention and suicide prevention. They have a 24 hour text line. Um, you can text START uh, to 678 678 and get in touch with someone. This is a great um, resource uh, to provide for um, youth again, who may not feel comfortable talking to family at that time and giving them someone to talk to if, if they're at home and need that support. Um, Society for Sexual, Affectional, Intersex, and Gender Expansive Identities, um, sagecounseling.org. 
and some other more local resources, again, local to the Chicagoland area. Um, many of the hospitals around us have developed gender, um, uh, gender programs. Lurie's has a great gender clinic. Um, UIC, our University of Chicago, um, has a um, pediatric and adolescent care uh, group. Uh, they also do a lot of work with adult transgender medicine and gender nonconforming care. Um, UIC has a gender and sexuality center, uh, University of Illinois, Chicago. Rush um, also provides gender affirming care. Howard Brown um, is a resource that is more for adults and young adults, um, but provides a lot of trans and non-binary health care. Um, one other resource that I discovered while I was um, researching for this presentation is called Brave Space Alliance, um, which is a Black-led, trans-led um, center supporting LGBTQ plus youth um, and adults in the South and West Side in Chicago. Um, then there's also the Chicago Gender Society, um, which has been active in Chicago now for 34 years. So some parent education. Um, so first of all, you know, parents have a lot of questions about gender because many are coming to you because they have only ever experienced the, the internal, um, you know, identity of being cisgendered. And, you know, I, I had to stop and think about this even myself from, from a young age. Um, you know, I, I knew that there were male, I knew that there was female. Um, and, you know, I never, never questioned that gender identity. And even as an adult have never questioned that gender identity, but there are many people who, who do. And so just understanding, well, how do you know what gender is? It's really that internal experience. And so, you know, for gender is flexible in, in young kids. Most start to develop concepts of gender identity between the ages of three to five. You know, around two to three, they, they start understanding, you know, there can be male and female. Um, but by, by the age of five, and sometimes earlier, um, oftentimes, you know, kids will have a concept and, and understand their gender identity. Um, but gender identity is not as rigid as we once thought, um, and there's definitely this period starting around middle school, extending through adolescence, where transgender, gender nonconforming youth are often continuing to explore and gain further understanding of their own gender identity. Um, and this is what we see even in, you know, the diagnosis of things like gender dysphoria. There is gender dysphoria in, in, in early childhood and, and gender dysphoria in adolescence and, and young adulthood. Or adulthood. So more parent education. Um, gender can be female, male, both, neither, fluid. Um, again, many other terms used to describe gender as we've discussed earlier. Families will often ask if identifying as anything other there than their assigned sex at birth is a phase. And so it is known that some kids who, you know, I identify as one gender will will go back and forth, um, but m the majority of kids who identify as as gender expansive do uh, or, or or transgender do appear um, that this is not a phase. And and again, as I said earlier, people do have a good understanding of gender their own gender identity um, often from an early age. Evidence shows, though, that it is best to continue to support a person's gender identity and allow for gender affirming care. Um, and that to, is to help to allow for the best mental health outcomes. So what is gender affirming care? It's any treatment or support that is designed to affirm an individual's gender identity when it is in conflict with the gender assigned at birth. These can include social, behavioral, therapeutic, pharmacologic, or surgical interventions, social transitioning, um, individual therapy, group therapy, gender play, support groups, gender support plans through school. As I mentioned earlier, um, though I identify as a cisgender male, um, the topic of 
supporting transgender youth is very near and dear to my heart. So on the left is my oldest. Uh, her name is Alden. She was assigned male at birth, um, but since the age of three and a half, as identified as female. I asked her permission prior to giving this presentation if it would be okay with me uh, to show a picture of her um, when I was discussing social transitioning. And she said that would be okay, and she hopes that it will help some people. So social transitioning is presenting in a way that reflects gender identity. This could be changes such as growing out or cutting off hair, wearing different clothing, changing a preferred name. And so the personal example again that I can give is that Alden growing up was very interested in everything, um, did not seem to prefer, you know, traditional boy activities or traditional girl activities. Um, but after a family vacation where she has all boy cousins, um, she started to seem kind of frustrated. And prior to that, we had noticed that she was having a lot of trouble in the mornings around getting dressed, a lot of tantrums. And finally, after that vacation, she confided on her way home that she was upset because she wanted to be a girl and could not. And so that was the moment where I decided I absolutely have to learn as much as I can about transgender and gender nonconforming health. And so what I can say is that, at least from both personal experience as well as from evidence, is that social transitioning can provide positive benefits for kids. As soon as we got our daughter, you know, new clothes, allowed her to pick out what she wanted to wear, uh, it completely changed her, how she felt about herself. She was excited to get dressed and go to school. Um, and fortunately, we live in Chicago, which is a very accepting place. Um, and so this brings up a very good point because um, a study in 2001 um, by Turbin and Associates found that social transitioning does provide positive short-term mental health care benefits. However, if kids are not protected from harassment, then they can actually have worse long-term mental health outcomes. So it is so critical to be able to provide safe, gender-affirming environments to be able to get gender support plans at school, to for kids to be able to identify safe adults that they can go to with questions. Because if we don't protect them, again, those outcomes could have the opposite effect of what we're intending. So gender-affirming hormone therapy um, previously, or also known as hormone replacement therapy, HRT. Uh, but again, in this case, we want to make note that this is a gender affirming treatment. Um, it can come in, a, in two types. Um, there is usually puberty suppression and then post pubertal um, gender affirming hormone therapy. Um, puberty suppression can be started around um, Tanner stage two or three. Um, it is possible to start in later stages, depending on the degree of pubertal change and family or patient willingness. Um, uh, GnRH agonists um, are usually used um, intramuscularly, IM, um, and then there is also a subcutaneous implant that has been developed. Um, it's important, though, before starting any kind of uh, treatment for puberty suppression that baseline labs, um, estrogen and or testosterone based on the sex assigned at birth, um, LH, FSH, liver function, um, CMP, CBC. And again, Tanner stages represent the stages of development um, in puberty, Tanner stages one through five. Um, each of those shows different degrees of uh, advance in puberty.
Um, gender affirming, uh, affirming hormone therapy, um, however, is generally started later. Um, for those that are going to be getting gender affirming hormone therapy, um, it really should not be initiated without a thorough evaluation from a psychiatrist or psychologist to make sure that the person meets criteria for treatment, since there are definitely known medical risks associated with it. Um, gender identity should be stable for six months prior to initiating um, treatment with puberty suppression, according to the DSM. So potential side effects of puberty suppression, um, swelling at the side of the shot, since again, most of these are intramuscular, weight gain, hot flashes, headaches, mood changes. Um, there are also some long-term complications, such as potential growth spurts, bone growth issues, bone density, um, as well as fertility, depending on when the medicine is started. Suppression of puberty with um, uh, GnRH an analogs um, can pause the maturation of germ cells and affect fertility potential. So long-term complications as well, um, and this is more in terms of gender-affirming surgeries later on, uh, but the use of these uh, GnRH analogs um, uh, to those assigned male at birth early in puberty can lead to inadequate formation of scrotum and penis tissues, um, skin, which is used in certain gender-affirming surgeries later on. However, even without this, other surgical options are usually available. Um, in terms of monitoring and prevention, um, we are looking to, you know, get height and weight every three months. Um, it could be, um, it can be recommended to get bone density scans um, prior to initiating treatment, especially if there are any risks um, or concerns, um, and also can be beneficial for kids to be on vitamin D or calcium supplements. Um, Postpubertal uh, gender affirming gender affirming hormone therapy um, is generally once Tanner stage five has been reached again, which is the cessation of puberty. Um, patients will require regular follow up and lab monitoring. Um, there is masculinizing growth, um, sorry, uh, gender affirming hormone therapy as well as feminizing gender affirming hormone therapy, and the medications that are used um, are, are different for those. But again, most are going to be um, uh, most are going to be uh, intramuscular. Risks of um, gender affirming gender affirming hormone therapy. Um, since again, we we like to think about benefits of it, but we also want to consider the risks because it is important important to be able to talk to excuse me patients about these. Uh, so that they can make an informed decision about their care. Um, feminizing, um, feminizing treatment, um, blood clots, deep um, venous uh, thrombosis, um, heart problems. Uh, I know the American Cardiology Association um, had done studies to find that uh, rates of heart problems, strokes, uh, myocardial infarctions were, were several times higher um, in those receiving gender um, affirm affirming hormone therapy. Um, and so any patient at risk for cardiac um, or illness or, or having a significant family history should take that into to high consideration. Um, uh, different hormone levels, potassium, nipple discharge, weight gain, infertility is, is a big topic here, um, high blood pressure, type 2 diabetes, stroke. Uh, masculinizing growth hormone, uh, gender affirming hormone therapy also has its own um, some potential side effects, weight gain, acne, developing male pattern baldness, sleep apnea, um, rising cholesterol, which again can increase heart problems, uh, blood pressure, um, uh, polycythemia, type 2 diabetes, uh, blood clots, infertility, uh, drying and thinning of the lining of the vagina, pelvic pain, and discomfort in the clitoris. Um, risks of uh, gender affirming hormone therapy. Um, again, infertility associated with gender affirming hormone therapy is, is definitely a hot topic of discussion recently. 
Um, it is known that the longer this treatment is used, the higher the risk there is of infertility. Um, some people may want to take a break from um, gender affirming hormone treatment to achieve fertility or pregnancy, uh, but given the length of time that they are on this treatment, it may not always be possible. Um, there are different preservation techniques such as egg freezing, embryo freezing, ovarian tissue cryopreservation, sperm cryopreservation um, that should be discussed with patients prior to initiation of treatment. Um, then we do have gender-affirming surgery. Um, surgical options, however, are rarely considered for use under persons under the age of 18. Um, and though we're discussing um, care for youth, I do think it is important to mention this as options. Um, there are things such as vaginoplasty, um, phalloplasty, which are vaginal or penal construction, respectively, um, top surgery, which is uh, the removal or augmentation of breast tissue, Facial surgeries, um, so reshaping the face or facial features, um, Adam's apple construction or reduction, lip or cheek augmentation. Um, and, and for many um, gender affirming surgeries, patients will need to be on um, gender affirming hormone therapy for a minimum of one year. Um, a lot of this can also be to help for the development of different tissues that are used in those surgical procedures. Um, gender affirming surgery uh, tends to increase the quality of life and satisfaction with body appearance, body appearance um, while, while decreasing gender dysphoria. Um, there are a lot of uh, topics and things that I've read um, where people are concerned, well, what, what happens later on? What if, what if people are, are, you know, this is a, this is a major, major surgery. And so it's, it's not reversible. So what are, or at least to, to reimplant sexual organs, um, but what are what are, are there regrets? And so what we are actually finding is that rates of regret after gender affirming surgery are are, are low, less than four percent, um, and the decision to detransition is quite rare. Um, in a study by Bustos um, and Associates in 2021 of of a group of 7,928 patients who had uh, gone through gender affirming surgery, only 77 expressed regret, um, less than one percent. Um, and, and one other point to make is that in any surgery, there are going to be risks and people that have negative outcomes to surgery. So a less than 1% uh, rate is, um, is something that a lot of people are willing to take that chance on. So what... You know, we talked about all these different um, forms of gender affirming care. Um, a lot of people are concerned too about, well, what if we start treatment? Um, you know, is this something that is is permanent? Is it something that can be changed? Um, social transitioning is completely reversible. Again, this is supporting a, a person's ability to express outwardly their internal gender identity. Um, puberty blockers are reversible, though again, there may be some, like the the physical, like going through puberty is reversible. However, there may be some complications long-term um, in fertility, which they are still studying. Um, Post-pubertal uh, growth, um, gender-affirming hormone therapy is partially reversible, um, but not fully reversible. And again, gender-affirming surgeries are not reversible to replace sexual organs. Outcomes of what, what are the outcomes? What are we seeing in terms of providing gender affirming care? Um, the first off, what I what I take from um, my review of literature is that gender affirming care really helps. Um, research um, on treatment and outcomes for for transgender, gender nonconforming youth, though, is still in its infancy. Um, but gender affirming care has been shown to significantly improve various mental health conditions and social outcomes. Gender affirming care, um, including gender affirming hormone therapy, has been shown to reduce the risk of depression, anxiety, and suicidality. Um, it can improve physical body satisfaction and reduce eating disorder symptoms. Um, it's also been shown to reduce gender dysphoria. Um, for those um, in terms of, you know, look at numbers, um, Rates of SI prior to initiating gender affirming care um, in in, uh, in a study by uh, uh, in 2020. Um, and if I mispronounce his name, I apologize. Uh, Hugo, 
uh, Hugo. Um, the rates of SI prior to initiating uh, gender affirming care at 73.3, um, after initiating it down to 43.4, and rates of suicide attempts similarly um, decreasing from 35.8% to 9.4%. Um, a study by uh, Turbin and Associates in 2020 comparing transgender adults who had received gender affirming care or hormones in youth as compared to those who didn't. Um, and we're looking at odds ratios. So um, an odds ratio lower to one means it's more unlikely to happen, higher than one, more likely to happen. Um, but the odds ratio for SI in the past year for those who had received care in early adolescence versus those who did not, um, was there was a much lower risk of that happening. Um, in late adolescence, we saw that it also decreased risk, and in adulthood, um, decreased risk as well. So access to these gender-affirming hormones during adolescence rather than adulthood was associated with overall lower odds of su suicidality. So access to care earlier can be beneficial. Um, and also comparing uh, adults who wanted puberty blockers as kids. Um, and so the receipt of, uh, receipt of puberty blockers was associated with decreased odds of lifetime suicidal ideation. Um, the sad thing in this study though, was that only two and a half percent of the 3,494 person sample actually received puberty blockers. Um, limitations of gender affirming care. Um, current research does not show that gender affirming care directly reduces rates of substance use and eating disorders amongst transgender youth, though indirectly it has been shown to help with both, um, have been shown to improve body satisfaction, which subsequently can help reduce e eating disorder pathology. Um, gender affirming care has been shown to improve depression, which is also a risk factor for substance use disorders. And again, since we know that eating disorders and substance use disorders are more prevalent in gender nonconforming youth, it's important to routinely screen for these disorders while also offering gender affirming care. And I wanted to say thank you all today again for coming to hear this lecture. Um, I hope that I've been able to provide some helpful information. Um, I wanna give a special thanks to my wife and my kids. Um, to Dr. Kim Dennis, uh, to Dr. Alexander Chevalier, um, to the whole SunCloud team and staff, uh, as well as those from Gala Mental Health. Um, and again, thanks uh, for you all to come out to support and learn um, about our transgender and gender nonconforming peers. Um, and with that, I will open it up to questions. Thank you, Dr. Coleman. All right, so it looks like we might just have one question right now. So when we were um, we were talking about um, discussing gender confirming um, con hormone therapy, what is a Tanner stage? So I and I, I saw that pop up and I mentioned that. So Tanner staging is, is just the development of, of the puberty. Tanner stage is one through five. Um, each stage represents subsequent development of, of tissues, um, you know, breast development, lengthening of the penis, um, things like that. Once you're at Tanner stage five, um, you're considered to, to have uh, puberty is complete. Um, page one on the resources page again, but that's Tanner stage. So this is the this is the one that has NAMI, and then this is the other resource page. Um, so the 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 question um, that was posed in the the Q and A, um, how to support Latino parents and understand that this is not a sin. Uh, that's actually a really great question, and I'm currently working with just such a case. Um, and so the approach that I have taken. Um, in this, and I'm all, always open to hearing other advice, is to talk with parents very specifically about, you know, do you love your kid? Does, does your child mean that to you? And, and if so, then are you willing to do anything to support them? And parents usually will say yes. Um, in that case, then I say, okay, you know, and if the, especially if the kid is ready to talk about it, then we start having that conversation. Um, 
when parents and have brought up, you know, this is this is against, you know, religion, it's a sin. Um, what I explain to them is, you know, the outcomes for not providing support in the research show that there is a much higher rate of suicide, of self-harm, of depression, of all of these things we've been talking about today. So I try and give them that knowledge and information. Um, I, I try and educate um, while also explaining that there can be very significant negative outcomes. And as a result, you know, offering them to, to get them, you know, set up. The first thing too that I, I really try and do is, is trying, if there's availability, get them set up with a support network, um, a gender clinic, uh, uh, you know, L LGBTQ um, therapist or, or social worker, um, someone that, someone that can help support them. Um, because for many parents, it's not that change, that understanding is not going to happen overnight. Um, that change may take weeks, months, years. And so the, the best approach that I can offer is to be honest about, you know, if, if the, the kid is willing to share that with the family, to be honest about it and to then provide education and, and offer support. Um, because it's, we know that, again, being in a supportive environment is going to um, improve those mental health outcomes, which is why a lot of kids are, are hesitant to, to talk with families who, who may share those beliefs. Um, I hope that answers that question, um, but it is a very difficult and, and challenging um, situation to have to encounter um, because many people hold very, very deep set beliefs and it's, it's difficult to challenge those. A lot of requests for resources and slides, so I'll be sure to send those out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I will add um, citations uh, for the material that I got the presentation from um, later on that can be included for everyone as well. Perfect. All right. That's oh. a question about our treatment. Unfortunately, right now we do not have residential treatment for adolescents, but we are in the process of um, of, of developing such a residential center um, that will hopefully focus on, um, you know, working with these patients um, and, and substance use eating disorders. Um, but we are in development of that right now because we recognize it as um, a much needed resource. Are there any other questions? All right. I think we're all set. Thank you all. Have a good rest of your afternoon. Thank you all so much. <laughs>